The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, please turn with me to chapter 1 of the gospel of Jesus according to Mark, which begins on page 836, 836, in those black Bibles underneath your chairs in front of you. So we started this series in Mark on January 1st. We've seen that verse 1 is more of a title. There's no verb in that sentence. It sets the stage to give the backstory of the good news of Jesus and his teaching and his work. So in verses 2 through 8, we saw that John's preaching and baptizing prepared the way for Jesus to fulfill God's promise to his people. And moving on last week, we saw in verses 9 through 13 that Jesus' water baptism and his wilderness temptation identified him with us. So Jesus identifies with us in our temptation. And of course, he endured every temptation so that he would be the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins. So today we turn to verses 14 through 20, where we will see, Lord willing, that the gospel of the kingdom of God is a life-changing invitation to a life-giving transformation. Would you pray with me as we open God's word together? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's life to us. God, I ask that you would guard my heart, that what comes out of my mouth would be helpful and true and right and good to mature us in Christ. God, I've studied, I've prayed, I've walked through these chairs and prayed for your precious people. And yet, this will mean nothing except that it is empowered by your spirit. So God, have your way. Use your word to do your work in us, your people, for your glory. And please come soon. Amen. So please follow along as I read verses 14 through 20 of Mark chapter 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James and the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the word of God. So the gospel of the kingdom of God is a life-changing invitation to a life-giving transformation. So this morning we'll seek to understand Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God, which, followed, uh, which was followed by Jesus' invitation to four fishermen, whose response then brought on a lifelong transformation, not only for these men, but for all who would follow Jesus with them. So proclamation, invitation, transformation. I should mention, as we look at last week and today, though a lot of things happened uh, between uh, verses uh, 13 and 14 and after Jesus' 40 days of resisting temptation. So there was the arrest of John the baptizer here in John 14. But be between the temptation and John's arrest, which we'll read about in uh, chapter 6, is where Mark puts it, there many things happened. The gospel of Jesus according to John includes things like Jesus turning water into wine, Jesus going into the, the temple and flipping over the tables of the greedy uh, money changers. And so, so Mark doesn't include that at this point. Mark just jumps right in. He wants to jump into Jesus proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of the God, uh, that the kingdom of God is at hand. So a couple of the themes recurring throughout Mark are introduced in today's verses. So one of these recurring themes is Jesus' authority. Jesus' authority. So uh, it, it's revealed here as Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God and then commands the hearers to repent and to believe the gospel. And then it's also revealed as he calls his first disciples to follow him, and they do immediately. So Jesus demonstrates his authority here. So as you read ahead, you'll see Mark underscoring Jesus' authority by including accounts of his authority over the physical realm, like Jesus healing various people, and of course, when Jesus looks at a tumultuous 
see when the disciples think they're going to die. And he says, peace, be still. So, so we'll see a, a pattern, a, a theme of Jesus' authority over everything as we walk through Mark together. So next week, Lord willing, we'll see Jesus' authority over the spiritual realm as Jesus uh, heals a man who is possessed by demons. So for today, we'll see Jesus' authority displayed in, in the people's response to his call to follow him and then their immediate and wholehearted response. So a second theme that, that starts today in, uh, that we'll see throughout Mark is discipleship. So that is, what does it look like? What, what is discipleship? That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. So us, in, in these days, Christians with the Holy Spirit inside of us, in the sense we don't follow Jesus as if he's physically here, we follow in his footsteps, but the Holy Spirit empowers us to walk as he walked. So we'll begin to see these themes in today's verses as we see Jesus makes a proclamation of the kingdom of God, offers a life-changing invitation to these four fishermen who then respond in faith and then uh, receive this life-giving transformation day by day by the power of God. So proclamation, invitation, transformation. We begin with the, the proclamation of the kingdom of God. So in verses 14 and 15, as we look at the text, Jesus makes two statements followed by a, I'll call a two-part command. So you could say that Jesus introduces here his, by, by these verses, it, it summarizes Jesus' teaching. It introduces and summarizes what we'll see of his life and work. So his first statement, the time is fulfilled, this, this language reveals something amazing and glorious about God. So this phrase is found in Daniel, the prophet Daniel, who's writing in the Old Testament, starting in chapter 2, and found throughout Daniel, the same phrase, it's translated in Daniel, the appointed time. So Daniel's proclamation of the appointed time, and Jesus' proclamation that the time for the kingdom of God has come, are hundreds of years apart, generations apart. And God perfectly orchestrated these in his timing. And we see the same language in his word. So Jesus, and certainly Mark, wants us to make the connection here that Jesus is the promised king written about by Daniel. So let's dig a little deeper in that. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. So jumping back into the Old Testament, Daniel lived in a time when kingdoms of this world would conquer other kingdoms, they'd rise, they'd fall, and it was just a, a, a lot of tumult in the world. You never know who's, who's going to win and who's going to be the king. Well, the high point in the words that God gave to Daniel, that, uh, which included uh, that which came to him in a vision, or in Daniel chapter 7, it's about the coming kingdom of God. Daniel wrote this. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold... With the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So I should say this phrase, Ancient of Days, appears three times in Daniel. Uh, it it uh, points to God the Father as the, the sovereign ruler of all, the judge and creator and so on. So kingdoms of, kingdoms of this world would rise and then would fall as God's people waited for him whose dominion would be an everlasting dominion. Him whose dominion would never be destroyed. When will this come, king come? When is the appointed time that God has declared? The appointed time is now. Jesus proclaims as he begins his public ministry. Jesus is the promised one whose kingdom shall never be destroyed. The time, he says, is fulfilled. So then the idea of God declaring an appointed time for something is not unique to Daniel and Mark. It's found throughout God's word. So the Apostle Paul, who is a, we'll say, a theological resource for Mark, used a similar phrase in his Holy Spirit-inspired letter to the churches of Galatia. He wrote, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So, so Paul sees it too, and, and we need to see it too. So Paul's words that the fullness of time had come and Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom has come, the time is fulfilled, this all ties together. 
This is the sovereign, gracious, creator God who is Lord over all of time, who is always at work to accomplish his purpose even today. He has spoken. The fullness of time has come. So then Jesus' second statement, the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, that phrase at hand is also translated in some of your Bibles as the word near. So the idea behind this word, engizo, is that it's about to happen. So this week I was walking through the chairs. I'm like, well, Lord, how could I, how could I have the church understand what this means, that, that the kingdom of God is at hand? So childhood memories came to mind. So my brother and I, when we were old enough to be left home alone for brief periods of time, one of us, not going to name names, might get into a little mischief on occasion. <laughs> so that particular son would carefully listen for the garage door to open because that meant that mom and dad were at hand. So he could quickly clean up or cover up whatever he may or may not have been doing <laughs> in their absence. So the sense that, the, that something is about to happen is the meaning of this word, at hand. It's near. In Jesus' words, the kingdom of God is at hand. So the emphasis I saw this week in the phrase kingdom of God is on the presence of the king. The presence of the king. So Jesus proclaimed on the shores of the Sea of Galilee that the kingdom of the long-awaited Messiah, the Anointed One, was at hand with his coming. I'm here, he says. Well, this remains true today. So by way of application, do you live like the kingdom of God is at hand? Whatever you're doing is the thought of the garage door opening and Jesus returning. Is it a treasure to you? Or is it a terror to you? The kingdom of God is at hand, no less today than it was when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. So these two statements, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, are followed by a two-part command, repent and believe in the gospel. Well, the, this command tra translated repent has the idea of turning around. So the, the, Greek ver the Greek verb has a tense of an ongoing act. That's the, the Greek verb tense. So in other words, Jesus' call to repentance is not just a call to raise your hand and say, yep, yep, I'm going to turn from my sin. Whoops, yep. But it's a call to live in a way that reflects an ongoing turning away from putting yourself in the center where God belongs and turning to God and putting him at the center of your life. That's what repentance is about. It's, it's an ongoing life. So, I won't gonna go into the gory details here, but Pam and the boys can tell you that when we go on family road trips on occasion, I've been known once in a while to take a wrong turn. <laughs> so whenever that occurred, true repentance involved not just stopping the family minivan, but also turning around and heading back the other direction. This has happened to any of you, you know that no one driving a vehicle realizes they're heading in the wrong direction will just stop the vehicle and say, oh, it's heading in the wrong direction. I'll just stop here. Of course not. When you realize you're headed in the wrong direction, you stop, you turn around, and then you make the effort, stop it on the gas pedal, to go in the other direction. So there's this ongoing action involved in that turning around. And then you keep your foot on the gas pedal as you're headed in that right direction. So we walk in a posture of repentance, you might say. So similar, similarly, true belief in the gospel and true repentance that accompanies that belief does not just mean, you know what? I'm going to stop rebelling against God. But also, I'm going to start living for God with my whole heart. Scottish theologian Thomas Chalmers, one of my favorite quotes, as you know, uh, as you may remember, I should say, is, is that he speaks of this expulsive power of a new affection. The only way to truly turn from our sin is to see something greater, to see a greater pleasure, see a greater treasure in God himself. And that expels our lesser desire for the broken pleasures of this world that will destroy us. 
That's how we turn and repent. So I ask you, if you're a professing Christian, what does this turning around look like in your life? What did it look like this week? How has obeyed, obeying Jesus' command to repent affected what you do with money? How has it affected how you spend time that he entrusts to you? How, how, is, how is turning to God and living for him with your whole heart affected how you approach relationships in your life or how you treat people? Well, if you see a lot of evidence, rejoice. Rejoice in the God of your salvation. He's at work. Thank him. Thank him that his grace has empowered you to repent, to see yourself rightly and walk in his ways. If you're feeling some heaviness today, oh, man, <laughs> I, I actually, Paul, I don't, I don't see a lot of evidence, really. I, since I profess faith in Christ, the way I spend time and money and the way I treat people, it's, it's actually not all that different. If you're feeling that heaviness, I just want to say to you, that heaviness, that realization itself is God's grace to you. Don't run from it. Rest in it. Say, God, thank you. Thank you, God. It, <laughs> the older I get, I'll say this is more and more true, but sometimes it hurts to take a look in the mirror. <laughs> but it's always helpful in the end. You might see something. Even if you don't like it, it's important to know what's really there. So spend time with the Lord. He'll always meet you wherever you are. If you feel that heaviness and say, oh, Lord, I'm just kind of stopping. I didn't really turn around and start heading toward you. What might that look like in my life, Lord? So repent and believe the gospel. So this second command is intricately connected to the first. So we're not just to repent, but also to believe in the gospel. The word translated as gospel means good news. So Mark intended that every time we see this word good news in his writing, every time we see the word gospel, I should say, we think of the, of the good news of Jesus and his finished work in place of all who believe. So him who came to give his life as a ransom for many to restore us to a right relationship with God the Father. That's what we're to think of when we see the word gospel. So our Lord Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. So when the Bible uses the word believe, it's never just a matter of, inter matter of intellectual agreement. It never it's like, yeah, that's the gospel. I, yeah, I, yeah I, I agree. I agree. So the word pastuo, pastu, uh, pasteuo, it, it, that's translated believe in verse 15, it's best understood not as just intellectual agreement, but a commitment to trust. A commitment to trust. Well, sometimes the best way to understand something is what something is, is to understand what something is not. So you might say later today, oh yeah, Paul said this morning something about some 110-story tower in Chicago, the 12th tallest, story, uh, 12th tallest building in the world, the Sears Tower. Now it's called the Willis Tower. And, and so, so Paul talked about it this morning, and so I believe that it exists. I agree with him that it exists. He even put a picture up on the screen behind him, and I agree that there's a city called Chicago and there's a building called the Willis Tower and it's really tall. Well, merely agreeing that something is true is not what the Bible means with the word believe. Well, you might also say, well, Paul said that the Willis Tower in Chicago has these glass bottom boxes hanging from the side of the building, hundreds of feet up that you can stand in to view the city. I saw the picture he put on the screen, and I believe there's glass bottom boxes on the side of the Willis Tower. Well, even if you use the word believe, and even if you're real animated about it, as long as you remain seated right here, that also is not what the Bible means with the word believe. An agreement and a profession of belief that these glass-bottomed boxes exist and maybe are helpful for other people and they can do something for you, it still involves no commitment to trust, as the Bible intends with the word belief. So when you go beyond just agreeing that the building exists or that the glass-bottomed box exists, you actually step into the glass-bottomed box, as this boy has done. You're hundreds of feet in the air, 
You've demonstrated a commitment that you believe it's true. And this commitment to trust, by stepping into that glass-bottomed box on the side of the Sears Tower, hundreds of feet up, that is what the Bible intends you to think of. That kind of thing, when you see that word, believe. That's Jesus' call to believe in the gospel. So truly believing in the gospel in this sense means turning away from anything else that you'd place your trust in. That chair, the sidewalk, even the hallway of the Sears Tower. Turn away from everything you trust in and committing to live in the glass-bottomed box of discipleship. Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. So truly trusting that the life and death and resurrection of, of Jesus the Christ is sufficient to appease God's righteous wrath that you and I, we all deserve because of our rebellion against him, will always result in you turning away from that rebellion and turning to God. None of us will do it perfectly, but genuine belief is revealed by progress over time. We live in that glass-bottomed box. So Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, as the Lord issued this proclamation, we see that he extended an invitation to follow him. That invitation to Jesus' first disciples is also his invitation to us today. So a right response to the invitation to trust Jesus involves turning from sin and turning to him. So it's Genuine belief that, that moves us that way, that turns us away, that steps us into that box, turns from trusting in the sidewalk of ourself and stepping in the glass bottom box of discipleship. It was my junior year of high school. My junior year of high school, I extended an invitation to a young lady, pretty lady, even somewhat popular, Heather Giantini. I asked Heather to go to homecoming with me our junior year. Heather was clearly surprised. Not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> that I would have the audacity to ask her to homecoming. Well, after a super awkward pause, she responded to my invitation. Can I get back to you? I shrugged my shoulders and said, sure. Well, some decisions are bigger than others. It's okay to think things through. There's no shame in taking a close look at what the glass-bottomed box is like before you risk your life stepping into it. In fact, it's wise to do so. We all know this broken world offers all sorts of options to trust in him. So really, if you're, you're up in the top of the Sears, the Willis Tower, and some joker opens a random window and, and says, hey, uh, give me 20 bucks and step out here. It's amazing. There's a glass-bottomed box out here. Uh, you just can't see it, but, you know, just, just, just step out there and just trust me. Trust me. Go ahead and step right into it. If some joker does that to you, do a little background check on that guy before you step outside of that window. However, if you've heard from other people who've spent time in a real glass bottom box, if you have trustworthy accounts, maybe from four men who live their lives in those glass bottom boxes, Maybe you have instruction manuals and design manuals from the engineers and the builders of that glass-bottomed box. And all these trustworthy accounts tell you that you really can step out into that glass-bottomed box. And the stakes are high. That stepping out into that glass-bottomed box is the only way to a right relationship with God, your Creator. Do your homework. Do whatever it takes that you would take that step of faith into the box. So our faith in Christ is a reasoned faith. Trusting Jesus is not like listening to some random joker who says, hey, for 20 bucks, I'll open this window. You can step out there, I promise, there's some glass on a box. And it doesn't exist. The Lord has preserved this trustworthy, historical account of the life and teaching of Jesus, in fact, four of them, so that we can trust him wholeheartedly. So faith in Christ is not a blind faith. Faith in Christ is a historical, reasoned faith. So look back to Simon and Andrew, James and John, these fishermen. 
they heard Jesus' invitation to follow him, they did so immediately. They weren't like Heather and said, can I get back to you? The fact that James and John left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants tells us that they, they had this profitable fishing business, they had servants, they had employees, so they left them with their dad, with other employees. So, so James and John are not leaving him in the lurch. They're not abandoning him. It wasn't disrespectful. It wasn't a slap in the face to their dad. But let's think about the background here. They knew something of Jesus. We knew from actually chapter 1 of the Gospel of Jesus according to John that this wasn't Jesus' first interaction with these guys. Andrew and Simon Peter knew that the stakes were high and they did what they needed to do to be convinced that they really could trust Jesus. So as I said, uh, John tells us, the Gospel of Jesus according to John, tells us that Andrew was one of John the Baptizer's disciples. So imagine that. He, he got to see Jesus be baptized. He got to see uh, John say, hey, you know what? Uh, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Andrew, Scripture says, went and found Simon, his brother, and said to him, hey, we found the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Promised One. Here he is. And Simon surely said, are you, are you serious? <laughs> Let me meet him. Let me meet him. And he came to Jesus. And then Jesus says, you're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, the rock. So Andrew, Simon Peter, James, and John, they'd already heard and agreed in their heads that Jesus was indeed God's promised one. Their response to Jesus' call to follow him demonstrated their trust, their true commitment to trust him. They stepped into the box, the glass bottom box of discipleship. So what about us? Well, following Jesus is a daily act of faith for sure, but it's not faith without evidence. You know, I can look around in creation and say there's evidence of God's wisdom and God's power everywhere. I didn't create this world. I didn't make my own heartbeat. Someone's beyond this. You have some idea of God's wisdom, some idea of God's power by how creation works together. But we wouldn't know about God's love. We wouldn't know about God's grace if it wasn't for his word. So we treasure his word. We treasure his word. So then the response of these men to follow Jesus immediately was not some knee-jerk response. It's a right and reasonable response to Jesus' invitation. They showed a commitment to trust him. I know that many have done that too. How are you doing in the glass bottom box today? Does your life reflect that you're living in the glass bottomed box of discipleship? You can trust it. You can trust his word. So generations of God's people had, had been longing for God's promised rescuer to appear, and now he had come. So as I, as I thought this week about the, the fact that Andrew was one of John the Baptizer's disciples, and he's in the boat with, with Peter, Simon Peter, they're fishing. I'm thinking, think about the conversations these guys had between the time they saw Jesus being baptized and the time he walked the shores of Galilee. Just imagine. You're fishing buddies? Can you talk about anything else? I can't even imagine. And then, on, on, on an otherwise ordinary day, Somebody walking along the shore of the sea as we're casting our nets. There's somebody, is that, is that, is that, that's, that's Jesus? That, oh, I, he, he, he stopped. He's going to say something to us. Come follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. This is a life-changing invitation to a life-giving transformation. And it's for you and me today, too. So what have you done with it? What will you do with it today? What do you do with this invitation? Is there any area of your life where you, you jumped in real excited in the glass bottom box and then you're kind of backing up into the hallway? Or maybe you're all the way back down on the sidewalk? For any of us, wherever we are in our walk with the Lord, there's, there's probably some area where we're hesitating to really trust Him to really rest in him. The application's the same every week. You hear me? same thing from me every week. Get in the word. 
Be, be in the Word. Let's be people of the Word together. And do the background work. If you think, well, in the Bible, is it some just religious document of people's musings over time? No, it's not. Read what it says about itself. Read how we got it. In fact, we'll talk about it in the Welcome to the Family session two uh, on February 19th. Learn what it says. Learn what God's Word reveals about God. And learn how God's Word acts as a mirror so you can learn what God's Word reveals about you. The thing that's been such a treasure for me is no matter how deep I've dug, and I've had times of doubt in these last 30 years, and I've struggled and I've wrestled, but no matter how deep I dig in God's Word, even if something appears contradictory at first, no matter how deep I dig, it's always, always true. It's always proven itself true. So sure, some things might be confusing at first. You might hesitate at first. But God will never fail you. So you've seen this proclamation that Jesus is indeed the long-awaited Son of Man who brought the kingdom of God to earth. The time is fulfilled. We've seen this life-changing invitation that Jesus offered to four fishermen on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Follow me, he said. So a right response is to repent and believe in the gospel that, uh, that is Jesus' life and death and resurrection counts in our place. And then turn from sin and turn to God. So saying yes to this life-changing invitation results in a life-giving transformation. And with the tail end of the sermon here, I'm not going to go another half hour, I promise. But this sets the stage for what we'll see throughout Mark. Look what happens to these guys. Look how God uses these guys who are just ordinary fishermen, ordinary people just like you and me. But they responded to the call to follow me. To put it in more historical context, Jesus offering to make these fishers of fish become fishers of men might have brought something else to their mind. They had that background and knew some of the Old Testament scriptures. Describing leaders among God's people as fishermen was not without precedent. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah lived during a time when most of God's people had forsaken him. Jeremiah 16 speaks of the horrible times that they would endure, but also that it gave them hope that God would rescue them and restore all who trust in him. So God called on his prophet Jeremiah to speak these words to his wayward people. He said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them. In other words, it's going to be bigger than the Exodus, what he does. He says, for I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I am sending many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. So this idea of God calling and making leaders to fish for his people and catch them is not a brand new idea. During Jeremiah's time, it was actually catching rebels for judgment. But in Jesus' kingdom, it's catching disciples for salvation who will then faithfully make more disciples, become fishers of men. So Jesus would make these guys who were fishers of people, or fishers of uh, fish, make them fishers of men. So as we dig deeper into the riches of the gospel of Jesus, according to Mark, we'll see that the gospel of the kingdom of God is this life-changing invitation to a life-giving transformation. God does this by his word. So just briefly, what, what might it look like to experience this transformation and become fishers of men? I know we have some uh, children here in the church who like to go fishing with their dads. So to the children who like to go fishing, did you catch a huge fish first time? First time you went fishing, did you catch a huge fish with your dad? Or do you catch a fish every single time you put the bait in the water? Quinn DeWitt, a few weeks ago, had some recent success with her daddy on the hard waters of Green Lake. They were ice fishing. Her dad, Andrew, did a lot of the work. He taught her what she needed to know to catch the fish and pull that thing up through the hole. Beloved of God, we have a father. We have a Father in Heaven who will do all the work. He will equip us. He will empower us to become fishers of men. I remember many times with my own dad fishing on Shano Lake for hours and hours at a time. When I was a little guy, it felt like days. 
Sometimes we'd catch a bunch of fish, it didn't feel so long then. Sometimes we'd catch just a few, and sometimes we would catch none at all. But just about every time, we learned a little something. Maybe about the currents of the water, the contour of the bottom of the lake, maybe the best lures to use in different areas. We learned something every time. It was never in vain. Well, God is on the move through Trinity Church to make us become fishers of men who will catch the community with the gospel. So we build relationships. We earn the right to be heard with the gospel as we proclaim the gospel. This proclamation that brings us life-changing invitation to true transformation. Well, we know that the most effective ministry happens in the context of intentional relationships. As I've said to many of you, I'm so encouraged at how God's at work in you and through you. Building relationships with neighbors and friends and family and co-workers to point them toward open Christ. And even here in the church, as we do this together, whether it's Kids Club, whether it's a Middle School Youth Group, Lydia's Cupboard, the City of Ripon Police Department, as we serve them and support them and support their events, from the bike rodeo, the neighborhood block party, the New Year's Eve event. Follow me, Jesus said. I'll make you become fishers of men. So the gospel of the kingdom of God is this life-changing invitation to a life-giving transformation. It does something to you when you're standing up there and going, it's holding me, it's working. I'm standing in this glass bottom box. Look at me. I'm able to do this. I can trust this. I can keep trusting this. When I think of this invitation, by the way, I never, dear, I never did hear back. It's been over 30 years. I never did hear back from Heather Giuntini about whether she'll go to homecoming with me or not. But I will say this. If you're staring at this glass bottom box and you're trusting Jesus, but you're, you're struggling to step into it in some area of your life, I encourage you to be honest with yourself. It's okay. Admit that. So I encourage you to ask the Lord to, to help you see what's holding you back. And ask the Lord to help you trust Him. We, we rarely trust Him on that we don't know, right? So get to know God's in His Word. We're not going to trust Him. And this is life and death. We won't trust Him truly unless we know Him truly. So as I always do, I encourage you every week, take, do whatever it does, do whatever it takes to deal with the doubts, and spend time with the Lord. Because He will always meet you wherever you are.